This is the In Context Podcast with your host, Karen von Hippel. Good afternoon and welcome to today's edition of In Context, Rusi's podcast. I'm Karen von Hippel, the Director General at Rusi. Today we are talking with Sir Malcolm Rifkind, who is the former Foreign Secretary and the former Defense Minister. After today's podcast, we will be taking a break over the holidays, so look forward to seeing you in January. If you like the podcast, please do subscribe, and we will notify you when the episodes come out, which is every two weeks. I'm Karen Von Hippel, the DG at RUSI. Welcome to this week's edition of In Context. It's our bi-weekly podcast uh, where we interview very interesting people. And today it's our pleasure to welcome Sir Malcolm Rifkin, a conservative politician, who most of you will know that he served as a minister for 18 years. The longest uninterrupted service, uh, well, let's just say it's longer than anyone since Lord Palmerston in the 19th century. Uh, And of course, Critically, he's a senior associate fellow at RUSI. So welcome, Sir Malcolm. Thank you very much. Uh, you have certainly had a number of highlights, and your life has been so busy, it's very hard for me to know where to start. But what I'd like to do is uh, start at the very beginning. And so let's just start. You were born in Edinburgh, but your grandparents were refugees, right? Um, no, not quite refugees. I, uh, so far as we know, they were probably better described as economic migrants. They came from Lithuania, and they have been obviously pogroms and part of the Russian Empire against Jewish uh, families. But so far as we know, that was not the reason. My great uncle had settled in Edinburgh in 1896. We never discovered why. And he sent a message to his brother, my grandfather, saying it's a great place, Edinburgh. Uh, why don't you come as well? He, my grandfather came with his uh, newly married wife yeah. and family settled in Edinburgh, been there since 1899. The great stroke of luck was not only that they never went to America, they never went to Glasgow, they stopped mm-hmm. in Edinburgh. Okay, interesting. And I've been enjoying your book, and I, in your book you say, well, you don't have a Scottish accent, you have an Edinburgh accent. Well, or People they, would recognize an Edinburgh accent. Yeah, occasionally people down south uh, or overseas, if they know English well, say that you say you're Scottish, but you don't have a Scottish accent. In fact, what they mean by a Scottish accent is a much more sort of sing-song, we've been like this, and all thing, you know, that kind of... Uh, very Scottish accent, and uh, the reality is that anybody in Edinburgh would recognise exactly that I was a fellow spirit. Mm-hmm. It's basically Edinburgh middle class mm-hmm. professional, yeah. and that's partly because Edinburgh is like that. It's partly because my mother was English; she was from Lancashire, uh, but also, as you know, in, in Britain, accent is partly a social thing. Yeah. Uh, so if you're middle class, you tend to have yeah. you may have a regional accent, but it's less pronounced. Yeah. And then if you're a working class background, that was in the past, less so true nowadays. Right. And so, and you went to uh, a fee paying school, as you said. Um, you would not call yourself a child genius, but you did go to university at the age of 17 a year earlier. Yeah, but hold on. Before that sounds very exciting and very impressive, uh, I went with, uh, we had Scottish higher, not A levels, which were not as difficult as A, as a levels. And I had a grand total of two Bs and a C. Uh, which is not you know, not exactly earth shattering because I never went into my sixth year, mm-hmm. and the Scottish universities had a tradition of taking people younger, and I applied six months after the closing date mm-hmm. for the law faculty, which nowadays is one of the most sought after yeah. faculties of the university, and to my astonishment, they offered me a place partly because they had more places than applicants. Do they still take uh, younger kids? Today. Oh, yeah, well, it's a four year degree. Right, so a four year so degree, but, yeah. but so, they, yeah. they still take them at 17. They don't insist on it, mm-hmm. but it's not unusual. Uh-huh. And my school was preferred pupils to do a sixth year. Mm-hmm. Uh, but two of my friends had already got places, and I was born, actually, yeah. the truth be told. Yeah. And the university was the making of me. I yeah. just uh, grew up pretty well the day I arrived. Like a lot of people, for a lot of people. Uh, and then the other thing I, I was struck by was that uh, you did not seem to have this passion for politics from the moment you were born like other people did, but you sort of stumbled into it because you ended up being good at debating, you were a good orator, yeah. uh, you enjoyed... It's difficult politics. to be certain what is chicken and egg, yeah. but, but certainly I did not come from a political background. Uh, my family, my parents voted and they uh, were, would read the newspapers and listen to the, the radio news and whatever, but we weren't a political family, we never had political discussions. My earliest political memory 
is at the school during the Suez crisis in 56, uh, when I remember the teacher putting up a map on the wall of the Middle East and trying to tell us what was going on. And I, can, I have recollections also of hearing on the radio the Cuban Missile Crisis, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I must have been about 13 or 14. And I, I remember hearing about how this young guerrilla in Cuba, mm -hmm. Fidel Castro, had come down from the hills and had taken over the country. So mm -hmm. These were just snapshots of memory. Yeah. But my interest in politics was two reasons. Uh, it was partly being forced into that in the volunteer into the school debating society. And if you get involved in school debates or university debates, a lot of the subjects are political, so mm -hmm. you, and you're maturing anyway mm -hmm. by that age, mm -hmm. so you become interested. But it was also what was happening in the outside world, and that's what really made me more interested in foreign policy than domestic politics, because this was the 1960s when I was in my teens. And it seemed like every week some bit of the British Empire became an independent country in Africa, yeah, right, Asia, right, of course, right. West Indies, Pacific. Decolonization yeah, of a billion so, people was happening under your yeah. watch. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I had, I can remember now, when I was about 16 or 17, on the back of the door of my bedroom, I, when you, I think I got it from some newspaper, I had a big map of the world, but it wasn't a geographical map, it was a political map. Mm -hmm. It showed all the, the boundaries of all the states. Uh -huh. And uh, I loved showing off in those days because, for some reason, instead of collecting stamps or something, a hobby of that kind, I could tell you the capital country of, yeah. the capital yeah. city of every country. It's been great at, at Quiz Night at the Pub. It came in very useful <laughs> university challenge, which I did quite <laughs> right. when I was in my right. uh, university. Right. Um, so it, it sort of crept up in me, yeah. the interest in politics. Yeah, no, that's interesting. And people come into this field in, in so many different ways. And that's what's been so interesting about this podcast as we talk to people who've been very successful and, you know, try to understand what motivated them to uh, get to where they were. Uh, so you then went to uh, Edinburgh, U University of Edinburgh, and uh, studied must law. must correct, you're talking about my accent. It's not Edinburgh, it's, it's Edinburgh. <laughs> Edinburgh. 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 My brother I actually, my brother, my older brother is an astronomer. He spent uh, a, a sabbatical year there, the very famous astronomer, a woman yes. who should have won the Nobel Prize. Can't remember her name, but because she was a grad student at the time, her supervisor won the Nobel Prize. Uh, maybe I'll just won't pronounce well, it. Well, we have an observatory actually on the top exactly. of Carlton Hill, just right. In the, right in the heart of it. That's where he was. Next to the what used to be the old city prison. <laughs> Not quite sure why they should have been seen to be there so close, but there we are. So then you, uh, I'm going to come back to the Robin Cook story because I think it's quite fascinating how you and Robin Cook shadowed each other for mm. years from uni on. Um, and you ended up, I think, having a very positive relationship, even though you, you probably argued. I got on better with him than most of the Labour Party. <laughs> Uh, but you did a postgraduate degree in African politics. Uh, part of it, it was partly, yes, I had read law as my first degree, and I already decided I wanted to go to the Scottish Bar. Mm -hmm. So the Scottish legal system is different than the English one, but we have the equivalent of barristers called advocates, we, we can go, and it's the same sort of job. And that required me either to do a four years law honours degree at Edinburgh University in law, uh, or I could do a, an ordinary degree for three years and then combine it with a, a either a second ordinary degree or a master's. Mm -hmm. And I got the opportunity to do a master's in what was then social science. And uh, it was political studies that I was interested in, but I had to choose a special subject mm -hmm. and I chose Africa. And that's before you had gone to oh, yes. Southern yeah. Rhodesia? It was primarily, I, again, I had become interested in Africa because of the outside world, mm -hmm. what was happening in Africa. Mm -hmm. And because at that time, uh, you had two things that were really fascinating. One was growing understandable controversy of apartheid in South Africa, mm -hmm. and all the issues that that gave rise to. And then, in a sense, linked to that, but quite separate, uh, Rhodesia. And Southern Rhodesia had declared what's called UDI, a Unilateral Declaration of Independence, in 1965. And uh, uh, that dominated, to a significant degree, uh, the British politics uh, for a good number of years. Mm -hmm. I remember Harold Wilson, when he made one attempt to reach a, uh, a solution uh, he was asked in the House of Commons, you promised you would never negotiate with Ian Smith because he's of you know, the illegality. Uh, and uh, Wilson apparently in a speech at the Labour conference said, we have never negotiated with them. Uh, we have talked to them, and we've called them ours and ours, but we've never negotiated, <laughs> <laughs> which is a rather uh, improbable. Interpretation, exactly. Yes. Um, actually, I skipped this stage because in fact, uh, when you were still in, was it uni or? even school when you briefly became a member of the Liberal Party. 
And that was in my first question. When I went up to Edinburgh University as an undergraduate, as a student, 1967, uh, I'd been interested in politics through the School Debating Society. I, my family background was, was primarily conservative. My father was certainly booted conservative. He was a small businessman. Uh, so not really the consequence of our background rather than any philosophical beliefs. You know, we, we, lived, we owned our own house, which was a modest flat, but we owned it. We, I went to a fee paying school and all that kind of thing. So it, it, there was a natural identification with the Conservative Party of that time. Mm -hmm. However, the Conservative Party had been already in power for about 12 or 13 years. Alec Hume, Alec Douglas Hume was the Prime Minister mm -hmm. after Harold Macmillan. And there you had two rather grand, sort of gross more Tories which I didn't identify, mm -hmm. I don't know, here the liars or whatever, Edinburgh, sort of lower middle class, urban mad. Mm -hmm. And the Liberals looked a lot more interesting at that stage because they had Joe Drummond, mm -hmm. uh, David Steele, Jeremy Thorpe, a lot of, you know, what, yeah. what everyone thinks of other things, they, they, they were pretty articulate and pretty mm -hmm. charismatic kind of figures. And so I joined the Liberal Club and I was a member for a year. I didn't resign because of any great ideological dispute. I found them the most boring club of all the political clubs. Uh, their parties were very boring. Mm -hmm. They were nice people, mm -hmm. but rather dull and well-meaning. And I decided, because I was seeing the University Tory Club operating, that I could either be a right-wing liberal or a left-wing Tory. Mm -hmm. So I decided that... Be a left-wing Tory. Yes, it, 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 it was no great uh, ideological conversion. It just uh, sounded sensible at the time. It reminded me when I was at Oxford many years ago, I, a friend of mine signed us up for a bunch of clubs that looked fun, and she signed us up for the Monday Club. So I went to one of their dinners, and then I was slightly horrified. There was one guy wearing a monocle at the dinner, even. And uh, I asked him to remove my name from the list, just in case I ever wanted to run for office. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a saying in Scotland, if you didn't ken, you ken the do. If you didn't know, you know now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Then, then after uh, you, so you taught in what was in Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe. Uh, are you still following it today? Following oh yes, I was in. Uh, I visited Harare about two or three months ago. Uh -huh. Saw Minangkabau. Uh -huh. Just uh -huh. no, about a month before the election. Right. A few weeks, ago, about a month or so before the election. I I met Mugabe several times over the years. Indeed, I'd had to meet him several times as uh, Minister of State for Africa and then as Foreign Secretary. But I, although I knew about Minangkabau, I never met him before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, people are still very concerned about what's happening today. Well, he, what was deeply depressing was not just that uh, he won, which was unfortunate, yeah. but, but I, I thought inevitable, I'm sure that would happen. But it was what happened in the immediate aftermath, right. uh, when we saw the army behaving as if there'd been no change, beating right. up people. Yeah, arresting, they arrested opposition arresting leaders, like opposition leader, all that kind of thing. And, like that. and what we didn't know for certain was whether Minangagwa wanted that to happen mm -hmm. or whether he didn't have control over right. the army. And I, I suspect it may have been slightly more of the latter because one of the more encouraging developments in the last couple of weeks uh, has been when he announced his new cabinet and he's got rid of a lot of the old deadwood mm -hmm. and the, the new finance minister instead of being a political animal is actually a financial guy. And the new defense minister is a, a non-military lady. Mm. First time, a woman minister, mm. minister of defense of all departments, mm. and uh, the general who had been in charge before has been sent off packing. Mm. So that might be a good indication, mm. but we'll still have to yeah. wait and see. Right. It's early days. Interesting. Uh, and then, of course, you, uh, oh, no, sorry, you got called to the bar and uh, became a full-time advocate slash barrister, as you said. Um, and then you, did you, so you became a member of the, Edinburgh City Council. Did you run for that or was it an appointed position? First of all, we don't run in this country, we stand. <laughs> Very lazy people. That's, that, we always knew that. Well, in both cases, we're looking for a seat. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, no, what happened? It was a rather curious because I wasn't intending or planning to have a role in municipal government. I'd been a parliamentary candidate for a hopeless seat mm -hmm. in the 1970 general election. I was only 22 at the time, so it was all just a trial run in Edinburgh, which I knew would win. And uh, thereafter, a few months later, I was approached by a solicitor who I vaguely knew, but who was chairman of the South Edinburgh Conservative Association. He said, we have a by-election coming up in a ward for the town council. Might we interest you? And my initial reaction was to say, that that's not my scene in the whole government. 
And uh, then I thought about it, discussed it with my wife, and then I thought, well, why not? Um, and there were a couple of reasons. Uh, as it, when you've just been called to the bar, you don't have much legal work. So you've got a, lot of, a fair bit of free time. It would be a very, very good experience, so political, and give me a higher profile in Edinburgh. But most important of all, by pure coincidence, the city chambers where the town council met was literally across the road from the law courts. Mm. Mm -hmm. So I would uh, be in wigging gown in the morning, take my costume off. So in those days, as an advocate, I had to wear black jacket, striped trousers, and all very formal stuff, mm -hmm. and walk across to the town council, where I was certainly the best dressed uh, mm -hmm. councillor. And it, it was actually a very good experience. Very and good. was Robin Cook in? Robin was on the town council, yeah. yes. Absolutely. We'd, we'd known each other before, yeah. because yeah. we had first really got to know each other at Edinburgh University. When I was president of the Tory club, he was mm -hmm. president of the Labour club. Yeah. I became a debates president in charge of the debating union, and he was my deputy, basically. Um, and neither of us anticipated that uh, we would have, uh, it was like a Cain and Abel novel by Geoffrey Archer, uh, <laughs> because uh, we met at university, uh, we were on the town council together, we fought our first parliamentary election, which we both lost. Uh, we were then were elected as Edinburgh MPs on the mm -hmm. same day. Mm -hmm. uh, we, he became my pair, uh, it was under the pairing arrangements you had with somebody in the opposition, and he shadowed me, and eventually ending up shadowing me as foreign secretary, and then became foreign secretary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, sadly, he, he, he died far too early, but uh, he was a very impressive guy. Did you uh, hang out socially? Did you go to the pub together or no, anything like that? No, no, that, no. Sort of, yeah, no that would have been too much. I don't think <laughs> that would have been good for either of our careers. <laughs> but no, we weren't We weren't similar people. Yeah. It wasn't as much as if we had a... But there were, there were some personal links. I mean, for example, my wife never forgot. Um, Robin's first wife, Margaret, was a, a doctor, mm -hmm. a hospital doctor. And when my wife was in the maternity wing, giving birth to our first child, Caroline, our daughter, uh, the following day, uh, Margaret Cook came to see her. They hardly knew each other, mm -hmm. but she'd heard. Yeah, nice. Was, uh, yeah. That was a very yeah. nice time. Yeah. Uh, and, so, and I obviously I went to his memorial service where Madeleine Albright gave the tribute mm -hmm. uh, in the. Uh, in London, and I think it was in St. Margaret's, St. Margaret's Church. Yeah. yeah. So you lasted four years on the council, and then you ran for the House of Commons. Stood. You stood for the House of Commons <laughs> at the age of 27, mm -hmm. and uh, essentially were an M you were an MP until, what, 2000 and... I was MP for an Edinburgh constituency yeah. for 23 years, till the great Blair uh, wipeout, <laughs> when all the Scottish Conservatives and the Welsh Conservatives and most of the North of England Conservatives all lost their seat in 97. Uh, I was eccentric enough to seek to win it back four years later, which I almost did. I brought the Labour majority down from 5,000 to 1,500, but mm -hmm. Blair was still too popular. And they then changed the boundaries, so I looked elsewhere and ended up as the MP for Kensington and Chelsea. Yeah. I must be the first person to have represented both the capital of Scotland and the capital of England, as it were, as a member of parliament. Uh, so I think I'm presented, but who knows? Well, then, and then, of course, in the last election, all the Labour MPs for Scotland, except one, lost. Yeah, well, I mean, right? uh, that's so. staggering. I mean, I'm, well, it, it was not only staggering how well the Nationalists had done right. uh, in that general election, but at the subsequent election, uh, the Tories won uh, 12, 13 seats and yeah. became right. the second party, the main opposition in Scotland. and. Uh, all credit to Ruth Davidson and those who made it possible. Yeah. So then now you started moving up the ladder. You were uh, headed several positions, Minister of Home Affairs and the Environment, in the Scottish, Scottish Office, Scottish office yeah. Parliamentary Undersecretary of State in the Foreign Office at the time of the Falklands War. Is that when you were negotiating with the Argentinians? No, I had no responsibility for uh, the Falklands. I, I was moved to the Foreign Office by then. By Dennis Thatcher, I was going to say, by Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> uh, but I had my main responsibility was Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. Okay. The discussions I had with the Argentinians many years later when I was Foreign Secretary. Okay. So that was in the 1990s. Okay. Um, and then Minister of State at the Foreign Office in 1983, uh, working with Jeffrey, Sir Jeffrey Howe, who was Foreign Secretary. And uh, you really worked to change Margaret Thatcher's view on the Soviet Union. Yes, I, I've become minister, junior minister responsible for our relations with the Soviet Union a year before Geoffrey was foreign secretary, when Francis Pym was foreign secretary. Mm -hmm. And I was persuaded by diplomats within the foreign office 
uh, that there was this guy, this junior member of the Politburo, pretty well unknown to the world as a whole, called Mikhail Gorbachev. Mm. And we should really try and make contact with him when he was so junior that he might be easier mm. uh, to get hold of. And uh, it took some time, first of all, to persuade Margaret Thatcher that it was worth trying. Uh, and then eventually, uh, to our pleasure, he agreed to come and he came with his wife, Raiza. And that was the famous occasion when uh, Thatcher ended up by saying he's a man with whom we can do business. 1984. And, yeah, and what struck me as uh, how different he was. I met some of the Soviet leadership, not the very top guys, but I met some of the guys. And they were usually very boring to meet. I mean, they would never talk about anything other than business. You didn't know whether they had a family or whatever. Uh, Gorbachev came with his wife, Raisa. And she was a philosophy graduate, uh, very cerebral, mm -hmm. but also very elegant, uh, and a particularly impressive lady. And uh, Chequers, Prime Minister's Dacha, as it were, mm -hmm. her country residence, when she went off to do her one-to-one -one with Gorbachev uh, that first day, mm -hmm. I was asked to look after Raisa. Mm -hmm. And I remember showing her around the library in Chequers, a rather good library. And she spoke a little English, but she mainly in Russian through translation. And when we got to the library, she looked at the various books, and then she turned to me, and through the interpreter, she said, I'm so delighted to be in England. I've always wanted to be in the country of Hobbes and Locke, which is not what your average Soviet white would have yeah, thought yeah. to say okay. in such circumstances. So you know, it was a, an indication that this, this was a, a much more sophisticated yeah. leadership, a much better educated, yeah. and therefore likely to be curious about the wider world. And that, that's really what Thatcher and, and Gorbachev had in common. Now. They didn't agree with each other yeah. at those meetings and, and at that first time. You know, she was the Iron Lady and he was still a convinced communist. Mm -hmm. But they liked each other, but they also respected each other. Yeah. And they, they both had insatiable curiosity. It's so interesting because they were also close to Ronald Reagan, who was not very intellectual. Well, Reagan wouldn't have been interested in Gorbachev if it hadn't been Margaret Thatcher who mm -hmm. recommended him. Mm -hmm. um, he would have not unreasonably so, you know, mm -hmm. Andropov, Chernenko, Brezhnev, Gorbachev, and the rest of them were all pretty ghastly. And Thatcher had, I think, a profound influence on him. Well, we know she did because he's said so in his memoirs mm -hmm. on many, many other occasions. Uh, she, he obviously felt, you know, if Margaret Thatcher thinks this guy's worth meeting and, and uh, trying to develop a relationship with, then I better think about that. Yeah. Very hard. And then, of course, he was really devastated when his wife died, too. I mean, yes, he was that very, was years later. Yeah. Uh, but they were very, very close. Yeah. And she died sadly rather young. She had mm -hmm. poor health. And that, that was very sad. So uh, interesting times in the in the early 80s. In 85, you became a QC. Now, I didn't realize you could do that while being an MP. Neither did I, until it happened. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, it, it's uh, slightly misleading, because you're quite right. I, I'd only been in full-time practice for four years. And you normally wouldn't become a QC, which is the phrase you normally use is take silk, mm -hmm, uh, right. until you've been at the bar for about 15, 16 years. Right. But they had a, sort of the normal thing in those days, maybe they still do, uh, that if they assume that you would have become a Queen's Council, if you'd stayed full time at the bar, uh, then you're asked, would you like to? But it's not honorary. And this mm -hmm. is what was wrong about it. Actually, I'm technically I am a Queen's Counsel yeah. and could practice and stuff. So when I ceased being an MP, I could have gone back to the I didn't, mm -hmm. but I could have gone back to the bar. Mm -hmm. And because I'd have QC after my name, people would think they're getting an extremely experienced <laughs> barrister, which would have been a fraud. Mm -hmm. If I needed a lawyer, I wouldn't instruct me. You know, <laughs> I haven't been yeah. working in the law since 1979 when I became a minister. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a nice, nice little. Yeah, no, thing it's interesting. Have, interesting, you know, interesting yeah. Uh, and then in 86, you were promoted into the cabinet Secretary of State for Scotland. Yes, thanks to Michael Hisseltine walking out. Oh, a byproduct of his uh, mm. famous uh, uh, resignation, mm -hmm. spat. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I incidentally, guess... you, you know, people will often think that you can plan a political career. Yeah. The two most important things that happened to me was when I was first asked to become a Foreign Office Minister. That required General Galtieri to invade the Falklands, mm -hmm. which led to some of the existing ministers resigning. Mm -hmm. Getting into the cabinet was Michael Hazel time departing. So I, I right. didn't actually plan either of these. Right, <laughs> yeah. and I think so was, it shows the arbitrariness. Right, of the there is a lot. Law. Exactly, and it's you know it's who you know, and it's what happens to them, and when they move as well. And I think people don't always think about that when they 
decide they want to be something in, in yes, politics. I, I don't want to suggest it's completely haphazard because obviously when, in, on both examples that I've given, Prime Minister, when she decided to send me to the Foreign Office as a junior minister, almost certainly was advised by the chief whip. So this guy made his maiden speech on Africa, he's a good speaker in Parliament, mm -hmm. you know, he seems to be interested in foreign, I'd been secretary of the Backbench Foreign Affairs Committee. So, you know, there was some rationale behind it. didn't know her? Behind it. Oh, yes, I didn't know her. Oh, you didn't know her? Okay. Yeah. I resigned as a front bench spokesman on Scottish Affairs mm -hmm. when she appointed me with a, with a disagreement over devolution mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. later. Mm -hmm. And she said in her own memoirs, I'm never entirely certain about this guy. <laughs> Uh, and so, uh, right, because you, uh, I guess when in 86, you had to deal with the poll tax. Uh, a little bit later, but uh, a couple of years later. Okay. I was there for four years. Okay. And that's certainly one of the important subjects. I was here when that happened. Yeah, I remember people out in the streets and all of that protesting. That was in London, never in yeah. Edinburgh. Yeah, okay. It wasn't any more popular in yeah, Scotland, yeah. but the, 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 the riots and so forth. Which were never weren't that dramatic, but there were one or two, but they were in the south. Not in How strong was uh, the independence movement at the time in Scotland? Uh, as, an, as an independence movement, not very strong. Mm -hmm. um, as part of a wider campaign for a Scottish Parliament, mm -hmm. it was become known mm -hmm. as devolution. Yeah, I mean that that was really the the main uh, phenomenon. And you were against that because you believed in the United Kingdom. You wanted a strong United well, Kingdom. Well, if you're asking about me personally, yeah. was, uh, my position was slightly different to most of the Conservative Party. The Conservative Party at that time was strongly against any kind of devolution. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> I took a more pragmatic view. Uh, I took a view that we have a separate legal system in Scotland. We need separate legislation a lot of the time. Um, we have a Secretary of State for Scotland, uh, recognising the territorial distinction, uh, it, uh, there is a case in logic for having an elected Scottish Parliament to deal with local affairs, as if you were in some sort of quasi-federal system. Mm -hmm. The problem about federalism in the United Kingdom has always been the size of England. Yeah. It's just so large yeah. that you couldn't have a, a regular, normal kind of federal system because of that. And so that was the tension, the, 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 the square you know, that you were trying to find way of resolving. And, um, but throughout that period, uh, I was more sympathetic to the concept of if a way forward could be identified. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I, I noticed you used the word pragmatic, and your book, of course, is called Power and Pragmatism, your recent book, your memoirs, uh, and you call yourself a pragmatic politician, which is uh, also an interesting way of describing yourself, and it makes a lot of sense the way that you do that in the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but what my original choice of title, and what I was tempted to do, uh, was to call it uh, my early life, the first seventy years. <laughs> the publisher, <laughs> publisher looked at me and said, "You can't be serious." <laughs> so I said, "Okay, I'll try and find something else." Um, and then, uh, in 1990, appointed Secretary of State for Transport by well, that's John, John Major. John Major took over, and I'd already been in Scottish Office for four years, and I wanted to change, and he was quite relaxed about doing that. I had not specifically asked to become transport yeah. secretary. It wouldn't have been my first choice. So actually, I found it more interesting than I'd anticipated. Yeah, I wasn't there for very long. Well, you were taking forward the proposals to privatize the railways. Can we yes. blame that on you? And that, well, that and that's why I wasn't there for very long because <laughs> I had no problem with privatization of the railways as a policy. Mm -hmm. But there was still a decision to be taken as to the structure of how they do it. Yeah, and in particular whether you separated the ownership of the railways network, the infrastructure, the railway lines, mm -hmm. uh, from the operating right. of the trains. Right. And uh, the Treasury and various other uh, policy wonks thought it would be a great idea to separate them in order to ensure more competition, otherwise we'd have a monopoly of right. somebody owning both the railway, the track and the operating responsibility. I said that simply isn't the real world. The real world is the competition to railway. It doesn't come from two people running trains on the same line. It comes from air and, and, and the motor car. Mm -hmm. you know, people, in a country like Britain, mm -hmm. uh, you, you have a choice. and You can mm -hmm. drive from Edinburgh to London, or you yeah. can get a train, or you can fly. Yeah. Like, um, yeah. And presumably you can go by ship if you really wanted to. But um, that's the real, and I didn't win that. Well, by the time of the 1992 election, uh, when John Major had hoped to be able to reach the conclusion as to structure and put that in the election manifesto, because I was being stroppy, uh, we haven't reached yet a conclusion on that, so there's only a very vague reference in the election manifesto. And the day after we, John Major won that election, the, 
the fourth term. Uh, the phone went to my home in Edinburgh and I was told it was Prime Minister of the line. And I wasn't quite sure whether I was going to be sacked, moved or promoted or whatever. And uh, he said, can I interest you in becoming Defence Secretary? And mm. I almost fell off my chair. Mm. Because, I mean, part, it was partly because he needed to get me out of transport. Mm -hmm. Um, but it didn't necessarily require the promotion to be <laughs> defensive, which is, that, that was very nice of him. Before we talk about defense, I mean, how do you feel about Labour's uh, view about nationalizing the railways uh, today? That's nuts. Uh -huh. It's completely nuts because the basic objective of privatization has worked. Mm -hmm. um, the basic objective of the, the railways have been declining for many, mm -hmm. many years. Mm -hmm. uh, people can have a sort of rose tinted memory of British Rail. But the reality was that fewer and fewer people were using them, there was less and less freight on the railways, mm -hmm. and the trains themselves were not particularly impressive, and after beaching, a lot of the lines had been closed down. Since privatization, and I'm not claiming it's entirely because of privatization, but it's a, at the very least it's an interesting coincidence, the numbers of people using the railways has quadrupled, mm -hmm. huge increase. And there's a number of reasons for that, but when you look at, for example, the, the facilities at a railway station, um, it's almost like a supermarket now. Yeah. Whereas before it was a very boring. But they're expensive and they're late and they're. Yes, yeah, there's this, that's, a separate, that's a separate argument. Yeah. There is a perfectly legitimate question as to why the cost of taking a rail, a rail a train journey in Britain is a lot more expensive than it is in most of continental mm -hmm. Europe. Or um, them flying half the time. Sure. Yeah. Um, ultimately, it is the public who pay either mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. They either pay through the fares mm -hmm. they pay, or they pay through taxation. Mm -hmm. uh, now, obviously, people who don't use trains very often would rather it was done by the fares being mm -hmm. uh, the main determinant. But that, that's 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 a national debate. Mm -hmm. It's not a consequence of privatisation. Mm -hmm. uh, you, even with privatisation, it was always recognised. Apart from the east coast, uh, west coast main lines. Most of the other services uh, would require, uh, and commuter services near London, <clears throat> most of the other services would need a subsidy. So you, it's always been a subsidized mm -hmm. industry. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's how you do it. It's yeah, no, it's the same thing. actually for airplanes in the United States that go to small, yeah. small cities, etc. So, Minister of Defense, and uh, from uh, 1992, Secretary of State for Defense, and I guess you had. Bosnia, uh, what other conflicts did you have under your watch, 92 to 95? Well... Balkan Wars, basically. Yes, I mean, we're talking about 1992, which is two or three years after the end of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And that made a huge difference, obviously, because mm -hmm. the Soviet Union not only didn't exist any longer, mm -hmm. but Putin hadn't arrived. Mm -hmm. We had that sort of golden period. Yeah. And I remember visiting Russia as Minister of Defense, and two parts of the program, which we certainly would have had some years earlier, uh, I was invited to address 60 Russian generals mm -hmm. to let, give them a, a lecture on um, ministry, how we ran the Ministry of Defense in a Western democratic country. Mm -hmm. They hadn't volunteered to come, they'd been instructed <laughs> to come, and a more surly lot of it would uh, be difficult to imagine. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that was one thing that happened. The other was going a few hundred miles from Moscow to a a Russian military base. Mm -hmm. And far from not wanting to show us their secrets, they were very anxious to show us the latest technology of mm. some of their weaponry and discuss would we be interested in possibly buying some of it or obtaining some of it? Could we would we like to see what else is going? I mean, they they've been told there were no limits. Yeah, those are the Wild West days in, in yeah, Russia, like right? Period. Everyone is trying to make money and all sorts of things. That's right. But I'm simply concentrating for the purpose yeah. of your question. Uh, on the um, implications in terms of defense policy. Right. So, so then we were having a debate as to whether we needed NATO. Mm. Uh, was yeah, it no, I remember that, right? You know, had NATO out, right. outlived this right. requirement. And uh, NATO's long term future has been safeguarded by no less a person than Vladimir Putin. Yeah. But I, but I even remember back then that uh, Russian military pilots were freelancing and selling. Mm. You know, passenger time and some of those uh, fighter jets and doing all sorts of crazy things. Yeah, uh, and uh, it's worth remembering also that it wasn't just um, Western defense budgets that were reduced during that period, the so-called peace dividend. Mm -hmm. uh, even more dramatically, because the Russian economy had collapsed, uh, the defense capability became a 
fraction of what it had been. Mm -hmm. So when people uh, refer, as they have done in the last two or three years, to the group and defense expenditure in the Russian Federation, mm -hmm. which is true, it's from a very, very low base. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think uh, that their defense expenditure even today is about 10% of American defense mm -hmm. expenditure. Mm -hmm. And it's higher than Britain, but it's not dramatically mm -hmm. higher. Maybe 50-60% mm -hmm. mm -hmm. higher, but it's not a huge multiple. Mm -hmm. China is like years ahead of Russia. And it's right. Expensive. But here you also uh, cut the size of the military in 94 by almost a third. And uh, that led I to... I didn't do that. Well, that you were responsible. Oh, was? Oh, okay. Oh, yes, yes. okay. And the only... The, 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 cuts that I personally was uh, responsible for, or at least the Treasury, mm -hmm. and I had to implement them between 92 and 96, uh, was uh, what became known as the Frontline First Review, mm -hmm. where I had been, uh, by decision of the Cabinet, uh, where I was a lonely vote against it, uh, I was required to buy into 800 million uh, savings, which by today's standards is not all that much, uh, but it was 800 million, which was an awful lot, and I uh, uh, found an unusual way of dealing with this because I was very keen to keep the morale of the services that um, it, it wasn't just unending reductions in spending. And I said to the Treasury, with the agreement of the Chiefs of Staff, you were asking me to cut 800 million from the defense budget. I'm not going to cut 800 million, I wish to cut a billion. And they looked at me and said, I'm sorry, what, what is this voluntary act of self immolation <laughs> I said, no, it's not quite as simple as that. Uh, as part of this, if I save a billion pounds, uh, I want assurance now that we will retain the 200 million extra and be able to spend it in whatever way we think appropriate on improving military capability. Mm. And we want you to have to come back and argue that with you. Mm -hmm. And they agreed. Mm. And that had two benefits. Uh, first of all, in terms of morale in the Ministry of Defense mm -hmm. and getting the cooperation of the armed forces themselves mm -hmm. to identify sensible ways of saving the money required makes a huge difference when you're able to say, yes, and 20% uh, of what we say, mm -hmm. we will control mm -hmm. to be able to improve yeah. what you guys do. And it also did enable us to improve capability in a number of quite significant areas. For example, cruise missile technology. Mm -hmm. uh, we've come to the view, I've come to the view as Defense Secretary, that the United Kingdom would benefit from having cruise missiles, which we didn't have. America was the only country that had them. And we could, in theory, have produced them ourselves, uh, but it would be much more expensive. And so during the height of the Bosnian conflict, when we were having a lot of serious disagreements with the Americans, over a policy in Bosnia, as you were from, not just Britain, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. Europe, all the European countries were not prepared to do lift and strike and various other initiatives that the Americans were keen on. And a lot of commentators were saying how our uh, relationship with the United States was deteriorating mm -hmm. fast. Mm -hmm. uh, that is not true. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't like what we were saying, mm -hmm. but at that very period, by coincidence, because of the cruise missile issue, I rang up Bill Perry, who was the American Defense Secretary, who I got to know reasonably well. And I said, Bill, this is not a request at this stage, but if by any chance you were to receive a request mm -hmm. uh, from the United Kingdom to purchase uh, cruise missiles, uh, it would be nice to know what your reaction might be. We don't want to ask for them and if there's no prospect of you agreeing. And he said, just leave it with me, I'll come back to you. And a few days later, I got a message from him saying the answer is yes, uh, we will, but uh, we will have only one condition. And the condition is when you uh, put out a public statement that you're acquiring them, could you clear the terms of it with us? Because we don't want anybody else to think we'd sell cruise missiles to them. Mm -hmm. This is a one-off for the UK. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, that not only enabled us to get the cruise missiles relatively inexpensively, which we have had ever since, I've often used it as an example of how the United States, not just for the United Kingdom, but with any mature democratic ally, knows that occasionally it will have strong differences of view. Mm -hmm. And although they'll be fed up and irritated, mm -hmm. it doesn't damage the fundamental right. relationship. Right, yeah, that's a sign of a mature relationship. Yeah. Yes. Gavin yeah. Williamson's fighting a very, very hard fight. He's obviously thrown everything into it, and he's been very robust and very public about his views. And some would say that's not entirely diplomatic. I don't sure that's right. Mm -hmm. You know, defense secretaries never uh, have too many allies. 
And yeah. I remember Margaret Thatcher telling me that. Um, and when I had to go and see her once, she about something else, and she was no longer prime minister. And I went to see her to advise her of something that we were doing in the Ministry of Defence. And once we'd finished that part of the conversation as I was leaving, she said, Malcolm, you know the problem in the Ministry of Defence? You've got no allies. No allies. The Foreign Office, she said, they're not wet, they're drenched. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. And then she started poking me in the ribs, quite literally. And she said, I remember, 1939, we went to war to save Poland. You weren't even born yet, she said. I said, it's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I got a withering look. Yeah, no, quite interesting. Um, so you've done so much that uh, it's hard to cram all these questions into our very short podcast. But um, then in 95, you became foreign secretary, and that was at the end of the major administration. Uh, so more on the Civil War in the Balkans. I guess probably the aftermath of Rwanda, of Haiti, um, and then negotiations with China over Hong Kong. Yeah, Hong Kong was probably one of the most uh, important in terms of a direct British responsibility. It was the last colonial responsibility of the old British Empire. Most of the work was done by Thatcher and Geoffrey Howe and Douglas Heard, uh, but there was still quite a number of bits to be addressed in those last couple of years. Yeah, so, and then you were one of four to have served uh, throughout the whole prime ministerships so of both yeah. Margaret Thatcher and John Major. Yes, I wasn't the only one. There were, there were four or five of us uh, who can claim that particular title. That's right. Kenneth Clark, uh, Linda Chalker, mm-hmm. um, Patrick Mayhew, mm-hmm. uh, and so forth. Um, we had a, when we were told that we'd overtaken Lloyd George and Palmerston was now mm-hmm. the, the, the last time this had happened, we had a great dinner to celebrate. and. It was such a good dinner, none of us can remember where it was held. <laughs> but tell us about the differences. I mean, there are such different personalities. And you survived working for both for a long time. So uh, tell us about... You, know, you mean Thatcher and Major? Yeah, yeah, Thatcher and Major, right? Yeah, well, John Major won the election in 92 because he wasn't Margaret Thatcher, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, like all great, fantastic prime ministers, uh, they have their uh, good years, the years when they deliver extraordinary results. Mm-hmm. and. Sometimes they begin to believe in their own infallibility, but whether they do or not, the public eventually get bored because they're past their shelf life. And so it's very interesting. In the United States, uh, there is an eight-year constitutional limit, two terms for the president. We don't have any legal limit in practice, as you see in the last 20, 30 years. We have a limit of about 10 years. That's what happened with Thatcher. Uh, She had uh, 11, 12 years, but just went around about that. Tony Blair. Tony Blair. I think it's going to happen with Nicola Sturgeon, the SNP in Scotland. And it's, even if you're not doing anything terrible, people get bored. Yeah, they get bored change. and change. And then they usually swing the opposite direction, as you say. Uh, well, it depends who's available. If it's a question of choice of leader, uh, then uh, Margaret Thatcher, when she realized she had to go, uh, her absolute uh, objective was that Michael Heseltine wouldn't support her. She had. Uh, uh, become interested in John Major two or three years earlier. He had had extraordinary rapid promotion. She had thought at that time he was a Thatcherite. Mm-hmm. I mean, those of us who knew John Major knew that he certainly wasn't. He was a good Tory, a very traditional Tory, but he was not a Thatcherite, never had been. Mm-hmm. But, uh, I mean, it, personally, were you closer to her or to him? No, uh, closer to John Major mm-hmm. because uh, there was hardly a, a, an issue on which we disagreed. I used to see as, as foreign secretary, I'd go and see him once a week. Mm-hmm. Um, and it would just be the two of us, possibly with his private secretary present. And either of us could raise any subject we wished. It wasn't mm-hmm. for sort of formal purposes. And I hadn't originally known him that well. I mean, when he was elected as leader of the party, I hadn't voted for him. I voted for Douglas Heard mm-hmm. as Thatcher's successor. I knew Douglas Heard. Obviously, I'd worked with him very closely as defense secretary. Mm-hmm. Um, and so. I had nothing against Major, but it just wasn't somebody I knew well. So I got to know him mainly as Defence Secretary and thereafter. And he has remarkable skills, uh, albeit his personality is not one that was as easy to communicate with the wider public. And one of his great um, uh, achievements, and I pay tribute to Tony Blair as well, is what they both did on Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was remarkable because there were no votes in it. Not a single yeah. um, constituency that the Conservative Party was interested in it was going to change hands because of Northern Ireland. It took up an awful lot of time and a lot of patience, but it played to John Major's strengths because mm-hmm. he, he would have been a brilliant diplomat mm-hmm. if he had chosen that kind of career. 
um, because he had the ability. Uh, I think it was Lord, the great Lord Salisbury who said that diplo successful diplomacy is rarely about great events. It's a series of minute step-by-step -step, uh, achievements, mm -hmm. which each by themselves are relatively insignificant, but which over a period of time and over a period of aggregation uh, can deliver a remarkable result. Mm -hmm. And that's what John Major was able to do. Mm -hmm. uh, Margaret Thatcher would not have been able to do that. Yeah. She had other strengths. She was a conviction politician, as you said. Well, that is true. Yeah. Yes, yeah. indeed. I mean, I, there's a famous example, which uh, you may be aware of, when she was asked, uh, Mrs. Thatcher, uh, do you believe in reaching decisions by consensus? And we all knew she didn't, but to our surprise, she said, yes, I, I do believe in reaching decisions by consensus. And we said, you do? She said, yes. And she thought for a moment, and then she said, I believe there should be a consensus behind my convictions. <laughs> At the time, I thought she was joking. Now I suspect she was entirely serious. <laughs> right, right. Okay, so uh, 97, you were knighted. You became Sir Malcolm Rifkin. Uh, Once a knight is not enough, is what one of my <laughs> colleagues said. I wasn't quite sure what he meant at first. <laughs> Uh, and then, as you said, in 2005, you were re-elected in Kensington and Chelsea, so you would be my MP today. Uh, and you briefly pondered standing for the leadership, but... Uh, I didn't just ponder, I, I <laughs> let it be known, and it was a marvellous folie de grandeur, which oh. I wasn't entirely surprised by. You never really been, wanted to be leader, did you? Or were you... Somebody once asked me, would you like to be prime... They weren't offering me the job, but they said, would you like to be prime minister? And I gave what I think was an honest answer. I said, I'd love to have been prime minister. <laughs> you know, to have that on right, your CV right. is, is marvelous. Uh, but uh, Living through it. The job, I, I was close enough to it to see how different it was to any other job in right. politics. He was as foreign secretary, defense secretary, I, I, and in other jobs. I saw Thatcher and Major. And the huge impact on their private lives and the fact, I mean, in, in both cases, I mean, John Major, like all former prime ministers, has the need for personal security and yeah. you know, can't just wander around the streets yeah. of London, yeah. which I can. Yeah. I can go out of a building and wander wherever I wish and nobody bothers. Yeah. You can't do that if you've been no. prime minister. And that is uh, quite a big uh, price you pay. Yes. Um, and uh, so then David Cameron formed his team. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, then, of course, for five years, 2010 to 2015, you were chairman of the Intelligence and Security Committee. Yes, which... I was appointed by Cameron, but I, I was the last uh, chairman to be so appointed because the first thing we did under my chairmanship was to completely change the powers of the ISC, the Intelligence and Security Committee, not only to give it much more control over the intelligence agencies mm -hmm. in terms of our responsibility for oversight, but also uh, to take from the Prime Minister the power to appoint the chairman and the membership. Mm -hmm. uh, the prime minister still has the right to make recommendations, but the committee and parliament in varying ways have the right to reject these recommendations if they wish. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the committee now chooses its own chairman right, okay, from the, those who become members. But the committee has oversight over MI5, MI6 and GCHQ. And the wider elements of the defense, uh, of the intelligence community, like the Joint Intelligence Committee the defense and Defense Intelligence, intelligence from yeah. an MOD. Um, and then, of course, you your career as an MP came to an end in 2015 mm -hmm. uh, with a, a, you know, a journalist pretending that they were representatives of a company, etc. Uh, I guess there was an investigation and you were acquitted. It, it, it was, well, it was all uh, harmless and faintly ridiculous, um, though it was uh, more than irritating at the time. Uh, I uh, was approached by people who said they were a company wanting to set up an advisory board uh, because they were contemplating investment in the UK. Now, anyone who knows the business scene knows there are dozens of companies that have advisory boards. I'm on one, I chair one at the moment. So I had a couple of meetings with them just to chat about what they had in mind, all of which was perfectly innocuous. Turned out that the meetings were being taped, and uh, the Channel 4, who were responsible, uh, then did a sort of cut and paste job on a television program uh, with lots of dramatic music. And it wasn't just me, Jack Straw as well, yeah. they did the same too. And uh, had me giving answers as if they were to the questions shown on the television when in fact they weren't at all. Yeah, yeah. Um, but what happens, of course, is you get these things announced in the flourish by the Channel 4 and by the newspapers, and nobody knows what the truth is. Yeah. 
and I asked Channel 4 for a transcript of the full program and they refused to mm. give it to me. And when the inquiry began, it took uh, Parliament's uh, Standards and Privileges Committee that have responsibility for these matters, took them about a month or so before the transcript was handed over. And once it was handed over, I knew the end yeah. result would be okay because yeah. I knew nothing improper had been said. And sure enough, that was the result. Uh, in fact, the, the Standards Commissioner, who is a completely independent uh, uh, arbiter of these matters, not only said there had been no impropriety, but said that uh, Channel 4 and the newspapers had distorted yeah. what had been said to make it completely appear improper. Yes, well, probably not for the first time and not for the last time. Mm -hmm. Not for the first or the last uh, yes, time. Absolutely yes, absolutely right. And, yeah. uh, you know, the difficulty is that, I mean, you know, one's friends and the people who know you have already made their judgment whether you're likely to have yeah. behaved improperly or not. They, they will have their own view on that. The wider public can't be expected to have a, yeah. a, a well, decision on that. Until right. But I, I can't complain because at the end of the day, um, the decision uh, of the standards commissioner that there had been no impropriety, that got as much publicity yeah. as the original allegations. You had decided already to step down. Oh, it was a pretty close thing whether I wanted to continue anyway because mm -hmm. uh, I was already pushing 70. Yeah. And uh, unlike Ken Clark, who may go on to his 100, mm -hmm. uh, I had no aspirations. Yeah, so how have you adjusted to your post parliamentary life? Yeah, you're Strongly enjoying. to be recommended. Yes. Uh, first of all, I have the marvellous honour of being a senior associate well, fellow at the United Services Institute. Right. I thought I'd better get that plug in to, <laughs> as a high point of this interview. Uh, but I'm also visiting professor at King's College, Department of War Studies. And one of the nice things at this stage, if you've had the kind of career I've had, is that a lot of people are interested in hearing your um, views and thoughts and so forth. So I get quite a lot of invitations to speak, uh, mm -hmm. either at conferences in the UK or overseas. I'm mm -hmm. probably traveling two or three times a month, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't have to go to do mm -hmm. any of these. Right, it's up to yeah. you to decide. I can decline them if I'm. Right. If it, uh, it's not sufficiently interesting to me. Yes, no, I've seen, uh, I was looking at the list of all the things you've been involved in, boards and councils, etc. And I noticed you're a member of the Queen's Bodyguard for Scotland. Is that like that television show where you... <laughs> you uh... No, that I'm, I'm no longer active in uh -huh. that. This, uh -huh. That is, is one of these marvellous uh, UK uh, dignified and ceremonial uh, organisations. The Queen's Bodyguard is, goes back 300 years. And we wore uniforms designed by Sir Walter Scott. Yeah. And when the Queen visits Scotland on official occasions, uh, she has to have someone uh, available to mm -hmm. ensure that her persons other than the police and the, uh, to, to, to ensure that she's properly protected. So that's all adds to the gaiety of mankind. Excellent, excellent. Now, just a few quick questions on some foreign policy issues uh, before we wrap up. But now on Russia in general, uh, I mean, you know, I know you were banned from going to Russia. Since Bad you order. <laughs> that's because I sorted, uh, uh, there's a list of about 40 or 50 of us, various Western countries, uh, who Putin has decided to uh, consider uh, as a symbolic protest against uh, various Russians being banned from uh, coming to the West because they're cronies of the Kremlin. Right, but you were quite outspoken when, uh, when he Well, it's because uh, at that Ukraine. time, I, uh, yeah, it was on whether there should be financial sanctions. Right. Because of all the sanctions that have been imposed, the ones that have hurt the, sort of the Russians most is financial and banking sanctions. Mm -hmm. And I was one of those most involved in pressing the British government. Mm -hmm to go in that direction, and uh, that was, uh, I, I've never regretted it to this day. Having said that, I mean, although uh, obviously Mr. Putin doesn't approve of me, uh, I do not argue that the Russian Federation should be isolated and ignored. And, well, I was about to ask uh, about that, so because forth. I think the West has, the West, uh, let's just say that the US, UK, other countries have tried diplomacy with him, quiet diplomacy, public diplomacy, they've tried threats, they've tried sanctions, nothing seems to work. What, what do you right. think you could think do to bring them back into okay. the fold? I, I think there's two reasons why I wouldn't reach the same conclusion mm -hmm. that it's all a waste of time trying to talk to the Russians. No, I'm just wondering what would work. I know work. you're not saying that, but yeah, some would, would say work. that. Yeah. Um, I, I would say there's two reasons. First of all, quite apart from the issues in which we disagree uh, on Ukraine, on the way they behaved in terms of the Salisbury poisoning and the issues of that kind, uh, there are other issues when it is hugely, not just desirable, but essential mm -hmm. to have dialogue, nuclear weapons being the most important. And there, it's not so much Britain or France, although we are nuclear weapons states, it's the United States and Russia, because although Russia is in many respects a very weak country, a very unsuccessful country, it's, it obviously remains a nuclear superpower. 
and the United States and Russia ought to be in close dialogue, both to continue and, if possible, enhance uh, multilateral nuclear weapon disarmament wherever sensible, uh, but also to prevent the current differences leading to um, accidental military conflict, which could escalate into something far more terrible. So, uh, on that sort of issue and on counter-terrorism policy and issues of that kind, it must make sense to have dialogue with the Russians as it makes sense to have dialogue with other countries that are not democratic states, mm -hmm. but which have a, an interest. The second reason really is, I suppose, because of my background involvement in, in the Gorbachev-Thatcher period. Um, I mentioned earlier that Gorbachev and Thatcher didn't begin agreeing on anything. Um, but I think you've got to get away from the fact of believing that somehow just talking to someone uh, is itself a major concession. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I detest Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. But one thing I will say, and I'll say it quite unambiguously, uh, he was absolutely right to ignore some of the advice he got and have that first meeting with uh, Kim Jong-un. Mm -hmm. uh, not because he will necessarily succeed, it mm -hmm. might all end in complete right. failure, but we have to break the myth that somehow uh, the, meet, the meeting itself... Yeah, right, was a, a, uh, no, a prize or was yeah. a reward or something and, like that. And the reason I take this view, I mean, it's partly because I remember a conversation I had in my first year at the Foreign Office when I was Parliamentary Undersecretary, a pretty insignificant minister, and Perez de Quella, mm -hmm. Secretary General of the United General, Nations, yeah. was in town. And I remember at the time he said something very similar. He said, meetings between senior world leaders uh, should happen with such regularity that they cease to be news, mm -hmm. uh, that they should not be deemed to be a success or a failure right. if nothing either dramatically good or dramatically bad happens. Mm -hmm. Because it's only by that constant dialogue that you can identify common ground, that you can remove some of the distrust. And, you know, um, there is an argument that one of the great successes of a good spy agency is when they discover that the other side aren't plotting to attack you after all. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, during the Cold War, the Soviets constantly believed uh, we were about to, or the Americans were about to launch some sudden nuclear strike on them, a first strike. And many people in the West thought the same about the Soviets. And the reality is that neither side had any such plan. Yeah. And the vast majority of, of people in the Kremlin had no more interested in a nuclear global war than we had. Yeah. So sometimes uh, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, paranoia, mm -hmm. which can be dispelled, if not completely, to a large degree by regular dialogue. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I mean, but I guess the, the sort of the last question I, I want to ask about politics is, how concerned are you with you know the longer Donald Trump stays in power, say he ends up with two terms, he doesn't seem remotely interested in playing the normal leadership role that the Americans have played really since the end of the Second World War. Um, and without that, there's a bit of a vacuum, a leadership vacuum out there. Now, it doesn't mean others can't, other like-minded countries can't fill it, Europeans, this country, Australia, Canada, etc. Sure. But at the moment, it seems that it's enabled countries like China, like Russia, like Iran, to be much more assertive. And I know this started under Obama. I mean, this you know it isn't just a Trump thing, but at least Obama and Secretary Kerry, Secretary Clinton, did try to maintain that role. It doesn't seem that, that Trump has any interest at all and even understands what it would mean. No, I, I think if you're asking me to give a, a simple, straightforward answer, I think Trump does substantially more harm than good. Mm -hmm. But I'm not aware of much good that he does do. Um, but I don't now lie awake at night worrying as much as I did when he was first elected. Mm -hmm. Uh, first of all, a lot of what we're seeing would have happened even if Hillary Clinton was president of the United States. Mm -hmm. China would be flexing its muscles. Right. China would be being difficult in the South China Sea. Mm -hmm. uh, Chinese trade policy would not be that different to what we have seen. Uh, the Belt and Road policy would be their main initiative. Putin would be very difficult mm -hmm. and, and do all the things in Ukraine that he was doing. So uh, I think one mustn't exaggerate the effect of all this, but what is happening is that for the time being we're treading on water in arguing against this ridiculous uh, belief in Beijing and Moscow that they can somehow 
offer the world an alternative vision mm -hmm. as to the right way to run countries and to uh, uh, relate to your own people. Uh, they would like the world to believe uh, that uh, what they call Western democracy is something unsuited to the world as a whole. Mm -hmm. It's complete rubbish. Uh, if you think uh, you only have to look at Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, and uh, to see how Chinese society can be as successfully democratic, or look what happened in Malaysia when they, through a parliamentary election, got rid of a corrupt and crooked uh, former elected leader. So uh, our system of government is not, it may have started in the West, it's uh, Christianity, Islam began in the Middle East. It doesn't mean it's not suitable for other parts of, yeah, the, right. of the world. So Trump's doing a lot of harm in uh, missing opportunities for American leadership. Um, and the longer he's in power, the longer we will miss these opportunities. But most of it is not irreversible. You don't think so? Okay. And I, I, I can only compliment you on having a, an hour and a half discussion, never once mentioning Brexit. <laughs> You're right. I, I thought I'd keep that to the very end. <laughs> it was too late for you to change uh, your mind. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, wait, maybe we'll save that for part two of the interview. You've had such a rich life, and uh, yeah. it's. Uh, been really wonderful talking to you. I, I, I guess the last question is a question I ask uh, everyone, and it's really what kind of advice would you give to youngsters or yeah. working okay. you know, about their career? I mean, you know, you obviously okay. didn't plan yeah. your I, I career. Quite, I, it's not like many people with my background, I quite get, often get asked for that mm -hmm. advice, and I will tell you exactly the answer I give them. I say, look, if you're thinking of going into politics, and it's usually Brits I'm speaking to, people in this country, uh, if you're thinking of going into politics, it's not just a question of whether you have the skill or the ability to do that job. Much more important is your, uh, whether you have the personality. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is that in any other career that you might choose, if you uh, go into business or you go into law or you go into diplomacy or you go into journalism uh, or whatever, you will start at a very junior level. And then depending on your ability and other people's perception of your ability, you'll be promoted during your career. And as you get promoted, you'll be paid more. And you might get to the very top or you might get to a certain point and then you'll be on a plateau because people will have deemed that's your natural level. Politics isn't like that. It's snakes and ladders. And because however able you are, even if you're the God's gift to the political world, uh, first of all, you'll never be invited to be in a government unless your party wins an election, you know, if it's a democracy. And your party may not win an election. Uh, let me give the example of the person you discussing with me earlier, Robin Cook. Mm -hmm. Now, Robin and I entered the House of Commons on the same day. A couple of years later, I became a minister, was a minister for 18 years. During that whole 18 year period, Robin Cook, who was certainly as able as I was, probably more able, never got a sniff of even the most junior level of government until uh, 1997. And of course, he didn't know it was all going to get better in 1997. You don't know. The best years of your working life are disappearing, mm -hmm. and you're stuck in opposition. And it's a big difference being in government. There's nothing wrong with being a backbench MP or being in opposition, but it's not as stimulating. Mm -hmm. Abba Eban, the former Israeli foreign minister, once put it brilliantly. He said, when you're a minister, you wake up in the morning, and you say to yourself, what shall I do today? When you're in opposition, you wake up in the morning, and you say to yourself, what shall I say today? <laughs> yeah. Because that's all yeah. you can do. Right. And it's not just that your party may not win an election, even if it does win an election. The prime minister doesn't have jobs for everyone. Uh, at most in this country, a prime minister has, when making ministerial appointments, perhaps 70 or 80 vacancies at various levels. But if he or she's prime minister, they've got 300 MPs to choose from. And he or she may not like you anyway. They may. Mm -hmm prefer somebody else for reasons beyond your control. So what I am saying is I don't want to discourage you from politics, but if you want to go to that way of life, you've got to realize you do not know yeah. whether you're going to be, I was incredibly lucky. Yeah. You know, the fact that I was a minister for 18 years wasn't because I was God's gift at politics. It was primarily because my party happened to be in power for 18 years. Right. Um, and that, and of course, you've also got the family aspect. Yeah. If you decide to marry or have a partner and have children and, and your income isn't going up and your job is insecure yeah. and you can't pursue an alternative career in the way that you probably could have done 50 years ago, um, these are quite important sacrifices. Mm -hmm. So I would never dissuade anybody from doing it, but I mm -hmm. that's what you're going to make up mm -hmm. your own mind. Mm -hmm. 
can you live with the possibility that by the time you're 50, it hasn't gone the way you hoped, mm -hmm. and you may be in Parliament, but you may not actually mm -hmm. have much influence mm -hmm. compared to what you hoped to have. Yeah. Now, many people who are just MPs are doing a super job, that's all they want to do, and they have enormous job, job satisfaction. And if you're that sort of person, that's great. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing it as a means to one day become uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer or Prime Minister or whatever, that's a gamble. Yeah, no, very interesting. Very good advice, I think. Uh, well, a uh, very rich conversation, Sir Malcolm Rifkin. I would highly recommend your book, Power and Pragmatism. I've been laughing at many parts of it, and it's, it's really wonderfully personal. So thank you for writing that book as well, and thank you for your support at RUSI. Thank you very and much. And look forward to part two of the podcast, okay? I thought you were going to say part two of the book, but you know, <laughs> wasn't aware there was one. Uh, oh, yes, of course, it, the next 70 years, right? <laughs> <laughs> you said it. Your second book, yes. Okay, thank okay. you. Thanks a lot. If you have any comments or questions about our podcast, please do go to the Rusi website and leave your feedback there. Thank you for joining us for today's podcast. We will be back in early January with Lord Nicholas Houghton, the former Chief of the Defence Staff. Happy Holidays! This podcast was produced by Tom Ascot, developed by Caroline Tranter, with further research from Neil Watling. Keep up to date with the latest defence and security analysis by visiting www.rusi.org.